Father, we bow before you. We thank you for the opportunity to get together and consider um, the matters before us as far as the local church's role and how we may do a better job in sending missionaries to fulfill the Great Commission. Thank you so much for all of these that have gathered. Please may my speech be honoring to our Lord Jesus Christ. May our consideration give honor to your word. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, he asked me to give a little bit of an introduction. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, the original introduction from my bodyguard helped a lot. Um, we were involved in church planning before we ever went to the field. It's good training for field-based church planning ministry to be involved in church planning in the States before you go. I was a mission agency leader and consultant and worked some with ACMC. How many of you are familiar with ACMC? Both of us who know that. Advancing churches and missions commitment. As ACMC dissolved off the face of history, Propempo was born uh, and we started this particularly with an interest in uh, the Arab Muslim world. And I do serve as, the, as an elder, a missions pastor at our local church near Atlanta, Georgia. I'm going to give you two quick one minute videos that will explain maybe a little bit better of who we are and what we're doing. So Propempo is the New Testament word to send forward or to send out, to send ahead. Uh, I think probably all of us in the room being TMAI and Shepherds Conference kind of guys are very convinced of the centrality of the local church in ministry at home. I want you to leave this session today convinced of the centrality of the local church in missions worldwide. Um, we come alongside churches to develop an effective biblical local church-centered missions ministry equipping churches to prepare, send, and shepherd workers for strategic cross-cultural church planting. So I tell people often, I am a missionary. I have been a missionary for almost 45 years. But if you cut me, I bleed local church. We're going to look at the centrality of the local church in missions, and we're going to take a look at some of the biblical foundations and some New Testament observations to reinforce this strong conviction that the local church is central to the task. So first, biblical foundations. If you have your Bibles, you might want to turn, but I have the text up on the screen. We're going to look at Ephesians 3, verses 7 to 11, and then we're going to skip down to verses 20 and 21. Let me read it as you follow along. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Skipping down to verse 20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, we read these verses and often we look at Ephesians chapter 3 with a lot of different lenses that color our perception of what's going on here. But Ephesians chapter 3 is by and large a missions chapter. It launches from Ephesians 2 in the description of our deadness before Christ and our being made alive and our being made for works that he's prepared ahead of time. It describes how in early part of chapter 3 how that, that dividing wall barrier is now broken down between Jews and Gentiles, but even in a bigger way between those who have had the word of God and those who have not had the word of God available to them, right? So there's no ethnic distinctions anymore. There's no threshold of becoming a Jew in order to become a Christian. All of that has been dissipated. It's been broken down, it says. And then Paul gives his personal testimony, which he gives in several different places. But this was specific about his calling. He said, I was called to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's the gospel. 
But he goes on to say, and to bring to light what is the administration of that mystery so that everyone would understand that it's through the church, the unsearchable, that the uh, manifold wisdom of God is made known. And this was always his purpose. So I lock on that every time I see the word purpose used in Scripture. That's a very important statement to realize. Paul says that his ministry in preaching the gospel as a missionary was to the end that churches, local churches, in fact, it changes our hermeneutic. I'll touch on this a little bit later. It changes in how we think about even how the word church is used when we read it in the New Testament. And I would maintain that most times when you see the word church used, you've got to think local church. It just doesn't make sense to always have the church as sort of this cloudy, universal church idea. It's not that. Paul was writing to local churches. He planted local churches. He was involved in local churches. So when he says church here, the wisdom of God being made known through churches, and this was his eternal purpose, then we need to wake up and say, it's the local church that is the focus of that, the center of that. That's where God gives his attention as the means of communicating the gospel and the natural resulting ends of the gospel and its impact in local communities all around the world, regardless of ethnicity. You follow? You with me? This is a very important observation to make. It doesn't come out of nothing. Paul has been schooled and taught and inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these words for our uh, importance, for our effect. What do we do with it? He goes on to say that God does all of these things. There's a little prayer part we missed there. Uh, pray for all the families of the earth, which is missional in itself, to this little benediction that we often mistake for other purposes, usually selfish purposes, actually, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. Most often, even if you see this on somebody's hallway or kitchen framed version on their wall, we take it to be for us, right? Uh, the college student prays, now Lord, I didn't study for this exam, Please do far more abundantly than all I could ask or think, right? The guy who wants to get a date with this girl he has a little, you know, distant crush on says, Lord, please do abundantly all above what I ask or think, right? So uh, just little ways we kind of abuse the context of this and take it away from missions and apply it to our own sort of selfish ends, usually. I'm guilty, too. But that's not the context of this. The context of this is that God is going to do abundantly more all that we could ask or think when we're in alignment with these purposes through the local church, which he's chosen to be his instrument for eternity past. He's always planned it to be this way. There is no plan B. Jesus said, I will build my church, right? That's Jesus' one building project. That's it. I will build my church. In fact, when he goes on and mentions church again, Matthew 18, speaking of the passage that we know of as church discipline or church restoration for sin, it doesn't make sense out of the context of a local church. It just doesn't make sense. So we're going to get into Matthew 28 a little bit and see it even displayed there. It doesn't make sense. Can you imagine church discipline situation where the elders of a church kind of put in the, in the metro newspaper or on the television news that somebody sinned and that we need to um, call them to repentance and perhaps even go as far as the stage of expelling them from church membership? That doesn't make sense outside of the context of the local church. Hang on to that thought. I maintain that you cannot fulfill the Great Commission in, as is expressed in Matthew 28, without producing local churches. It was fun this morning, um, even before session started, I, I was invited to sit next to Alex Strzok, right? And he's saying, you're preaching the same message, bro. 
So I'm sure he's going to do a much better job, but I want you to catch this from Matthew 28, observing it yourself. Here's what it says. We're very familiar with these words. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is part of the Great Commission. It's not separate from. It says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, it's important to realize that Fulfilling the Great Commission is not simply evangelism. And I say that kind of carefully because I know in some parts of the world, the parts of the world that we're most familiar with, the parts of the world that seem to be historically resistant to the gospel, resistant to Christianity, it's no small thing to have conversions at all. Evangelism is the process of helping people understand Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection, and what all that means, the offer of God by His grace and mercy with our repentance and faith in Christ to, to regenerate us. He opens our hearts to do even that, to give us that gift of faith. Ephesians 2 again. So I'm not saying it's a small thing that evangelism be a part of fulfilling the Great Commission. But you can't fulfill the Great Commission by only evangelizing. There's a whole lot of this passage left to go. So any missionary or any missionary organization or Christian parachurch organization that says we're fulfilling the Great Commission by evangelizing, I say there's a new New Testament Greek word in your vocabulary. You know what that is? Baloney. It's baloney. That's not what the Great Commission in Matthew 28 says. It's not just evangelism. You don't do like Dawson Trotman, founder of Navigator, says, leave your babies on somebody else's doorstep. You've got a responsibility to disciple them. And in discipling them, that assumes some maturity. You've got more mature people discipling less mature people. I hope this is going on in your churches all the time. Formally and informally. Discipleship where mature believers are walking less mature believers in life through decisions that will be honoring to the Lord. Through character building and lifestyle that's going to be honoring to the Lord. But it goes on to say baptizing. How does baptizing take place? It doesn't take place on its own unless you happen to be the emperor of Rome and command your troops to baptize themselves in the ocean. But that, that's not the normal way of doing things. The normal way of baptizing assumes, again, that there are more mature Christians that are attesting to the testimony of conversion of the younger Christian and bringing them to the place of baptism in obedience, following Christ's command to be baptized and be identified with him and with Christians and thereby become a part of a local church. Oh, yeah. You become identified and a part of a local body of believers that are mutually committed together. That's all kind of wrapped up in this little picture of baptism. And so we haven't even gotten all the way through. And we're finding that there are mutually committed groups of believers that are receiving new converts in through baptism and discipling them in the things of God. What else does it say? It says, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. What is the all that I've commanded you? Well, it's not just the things that are printed in red letters. They didn't even have that in the Greek New Testament. Right? It's not just the, the things that Jesus said directly, but by implication, and we find out later in the New Testament, the implication being it's all of the New Testament canon. It's all of those things that were inspired of the Holy Spirit that Jesus said, the Holy Spirit's going to lead you to know these things. And understand it. It's all of that. Teaching them is a continuous thing. To observe is the obedience word. To actually do, not just to hear, all that I've commanded you. How much time does that take? A lifetime. <laughs> right? And it, again, infers that believers are meeting together regularly for this. 
We find out later from the writings of Paul that the regularly generally means on Sundays, on the Lord's Day. We get together and we have edification, preaching, teaching, evangelism, all of the stuff wrapped up in the body life of the church getting together. And that is what brings us to fulfillment of this Matthew 28 Great Commission. It's not just evangelism. It's not just home Bible studies. It's all of this wrapped up together. You cannot fulfill the Great Commission of Matthew 28. The other instances of the Great Commission fill in a little bit and give different perspective, but this, that we generally accept as being the, the biggest statement of the Great Commission, is filled out really through the rest of the New Testament because we see it happening. And that's what I want to get to now, I hope, that you'll learn something in the process. So New Testament observations about this Great Commission and its fulfillment, I say that the planting of indigenous local churches should be the intentional priority of missions ministry. The planting of indigenous local churches. I would, I would caution that. I would soften it a little bit for my TMAI audience. Planting and strengthening. But the idea is that Indigenous churches reproduce. Indigenous churches have their own support, their own leaders, and their own propagation. That's what makes an indigenous church indigenous. This should be the intentional priority of missions ministry. I have spent a lot of time working with missionaries on fields scattered around the world. And let me tell you, a lot of them have not arrived at this a lot of them have established a little mini kingdom. They've stayed in the same place. They, they send home prayer requests and say, Oh, Lord, please send me a Timothy. And they haven't done diddly to create a Timothy from the very beginning. And how is a seminary-trained foreigner able to reproduce himself with everyone that's intimidated, really, by maybe his knowledge, maybe by even his style of exposition to be able to follow in that footstep and take over. And then you also have to have like graded Sunday school classes and choir and certain kinds of programs and this and that. And be, all of a sudden you have this, this thing that's accreting all kinds of inertia that's not planting indigenous local churches. Sorry, that was a little sidestep, not in my notes. Why is this assertion? Number one, reality. You can't fulfill the Great Commission without a mutually committed body of believers. It's just not going to happen. Number two, regulation. I alluded to this. Jesus said he would build his church. And when Jesus refers to the church in Matthew 18, in church discipline, it implies very strongly there's an in and an out. You know who the members are? You know who are not the members. That means you've got a local church with a defined scope. These are the people we shepherd. These are the people we're responsible for. In Hebrews 13, this is what we do. And that means that you have to have that kind of regulation. The remonstration, I call it, John's vision and revelation in the opening chapters is all about Jesus addressing specific local churches. And if you read that carefully and apply that to your own heart and your own church situation, it's scary. Jesus knew individual names and actions of every local church. He knew exactly what was going on. Let me extend that. Jesus now knows exactly what's going on in your church. He knows what's going on in your heart and mine. He knows how this glorifies him or doesn't glorify him. Sixty years after the giving of the Great Commission to those people that heard it in various circumstances immediately after the resurrection of Christ, 60 years later, Jesus is focused on the health and well-being of local churches. So what about the recipients of the Great Commission? What did they do? The people that heard the Great Commission planted churches. 
It's in the record, as best we can tell. Now, there were specific one-off stories and illustrations of people coming to Christ in evangelism. Sure. Ethiopian eunuch. All right? Granted. It was one and done, as far as Philip was concerned. What happened to the Ethiopian eunuch? What did he do? Historically, he went back home and he planted local churches, <laughs> some of which remnants are in existence even today. The original recipients of the Great Commission followed the Great Commission, obeyed the Great Commission by planting local churches. The recipients of the New Testament epistles. This is no small observation. Who were the rest of the books of the Bible written to in the New Testament? Local churches. Or local church pastors. Or those who were the shepherds of local churches. Even in the general, what we call the general epistles, they're more generally identified, but there are portions in there that know that their audience is specifically local church leaders. It's local church leaders who pray over the sick. It's local church leaders who are charged to shepherd under our chief shepherd, and so forth. All the way through, we're talking about local churches. The recipients of the New Testament epistles more or less underscore this observation that they understood it to be local churches fulfilling the Great Commission. The relationships, all the one another commands, assume a local church context. I get a kick out of, actually I get upset, but I get a kick out of some friends of mine through the years who have said, oh, you know, we just kind of go to this local church and that local church. We know this one's better at this thing and this one's better than that thing. And I tell them the New Testament word for that is baloney, right? I say, no, you need to be committed to one body. It's true that that body is not perfect, not by a long shot, but they need you and you need them. That's what makes the local body in all of its messiness, glorifying to God and showing the wisdom of God to all the onlookers. onlookers. The one another commands assume that it's all done within a local church context. You can't do one anothering with the 40 plus one another commands in the New Testament unless you have relationships and you know people. And you don't have relationships and know people by church hopping. You have it by committing to a local body and getting to know the people there. When you get to know them, then you're the one another. So this takes place in small groups and Sunday school classes. It takes place on Sundays. It takes place in breaks between services. It takes place in getting in each other's kitchens, both literally and figuratively. Understanding that the one another commands are getting to know one another and encouraging, admonishing, correcting, rebuking, edifying, helping one another. I just had the privilege of uh, speaking at a missions conference in Miami, Florida. It's primarily a Hispanic congregation. They got the kiss one another thing down. They do. Now, it's, it's not anything f flaky, but Latino people know how to hug and kiss. And it is, it's wonderful. It's like, wow, hey, we're in a different country right here in Miami. This is wonderful. Not like the frozen chosen where I live. Number seven, report. Guess what? Paul and Barnabas felt a responsibility to report to the church that was our original sending church. They go back there multiple times, and they're reporting the wonderful things that God has done, much to the rejoicing of all those around. And they were refreshed there. I didn't put that R. But they reported, and they got fellowship. They were refreshed there. Paul refers to this in an offhand kind of way when he talks about visiting the church in Corinth. He talks about visiting the church in Philippi. He talks about visiting the church in Rome, knowing that he's going to be refreshed by their fellowship before he goes on to the next task. There's a reporting and accountability there to the local church in Antioch. And I'm going backwards. Here we go. There's a resolution. Paul charges Timothy and Titus to establish local churches to appoint leaders, to organize local churches. I'm sorry, that's an administrative term. For those of you that are administratively challenged, there's a lot of that in the Bible. So find an elder that's good at it. If you're not, let's do it. Paul says to Timothy and Titus, there's a lot of things you need to pay attention to 
in terms of teaching, preaching the word, sharing the gospel, but particularly in the area of developing leaders. That's why he gives such a big section to it in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and on. It's just, it's a big thing. So how can you miss that? That so much of the New Testament and so much of the charges are to do this. I love Titus as a missionary model. He's great. I call him the missionary to knuckleheads. I think it would work out very well in Southern California. But Titus was given the hard task of going to Corinth and collecting the money. So Paul said, hey, I'm going to send Titus ahead of me. Like, he can get the job done, right? And then he's going to Crete, which didn't have a great reputation. But the Cretans didn't have a great reputation for a reason, apparently, that they themselves acknowledged. They were tough people. And Paul sends, sends Titus to Crete. Um, re request and rapport with local churches. Paul writing to Rome and Philippi. There's this wonderful, warm relationship with Philippi as a supporting church of Paul's multiple times, over and over, even in their poverty, they gave to see that the ministry moved forward. And Paul really appreciated it. And he writes the book of Philippians. The request to Rome is one of those uses of the, the word propempo. So he goes all the way through the book of Romans, basically. He gets to chapter 15 and he says, I have this special calling to go to unreached places. All of these other places have been reached or touched or potentially reached through churches that we planted in ministry we've seen. So now what do we do? He says, I want to go to this last enclave in the Mediterranean that's not been reached. It's, it's called Spain. And I want you to help me. He says, I want you to propempo me on my way there. And that propempo word, which if you hang around, it expands to not just like pay him his ship fare to go, but it expands to fully equip him in every way possible, including sending people along. I think Paul expected Roman believers to accompany him on his team going to Rome as he picked up team members here and there along the way. So he makes those requests and has this special rapport with these churches. It's a responsibility. When the Apostle John writes his little postcard epistle, 3 John, he's addressing a church leader named Gaius. And he says, hey Gaius, you're doing a good thing to show loving, lavish hospitality to these workers that are here among you for a time. And I want you to send them on their way in a manner worthy of the Lord. He says, this is really important because you become partners in the work with them. You become investors. You become sharers in the fruit of this ministry through supporting them and encouraging them and helping them on their way. That's also a propempel word. Send them on a, in their way in a manner worthy of the Lord is the propempel word. So we have churches have a responsibility to do this. And lastly, the ratification of church leaders in the New Testament. In general, observation, church leaders are not selected by blind ballot. As much as our American political system may say otherwise, it, church leaders aren't that way. It's not that way at all. There is a process of proving character and showing both conviction and competence to be the elder. And in fact, in our elder group, we add uh, Trellis and Vine says uh, conviction, competence, character, and our elders add chemistry. You have to be able to get along with the other elders. You have to be a team player. So that's our fourth C, and uh, admittedly it's not like inspired in the word. But there's this sort of assumption that, hey, if you're not a team player, if you always want to have your way, it's not going to work out very well for the, for the group for the team that's the elders there. It has a shepherding responsibility over this flock. So the ratification of New Testament leaders usually takes some time. I don't know how long it takes in your church. In our church, from the first time that a guy's name is brought before the elders as a possible candidate consideration, I think it probably takes at least three years to work through the process of affirming, and we ask his wife as well, is this guy ready? Are you ready? And we work that out together. Um, well, the ratification of church leaders is a, a church thing. I say, how can sending someone into a difficult cross-cultural situation be any less important to take time and ratify that person's convictions, their competence in ministry skills, their character, their chemistry, I've got some more C's for you 
attend a later session, you'll find out. But those things are very important. If the New Testament assumes that you're going to take very careful time to not lay hands on someone suddenly or quickly, then it means you've got to take time to screen, to develop missionaries. When we work with missionary candidates, I love saying this, our, our goal is to not force you to jump through a whole bunch of hoops. Our goal is to wrap our arms around you and help you jump through the hoops. See the difference? We're, we want to facilitate you. And if, and if anything happens that prevents you from going on to the field, it's not because of our lack of willingness to assist you. It may be that you drop out because you see, you know, I just don't have what it takes. That's okay. It's not a loss to God's kingdom. We're developing you and working with you as a potential missionary candidate to the place where you would really qualify to stay in a hard place for the long haul. And then when you go, we'll hold you accountable to that. Now, practical applications. What difference does it make to your hermeneutic regarding the church? I think it's like many stories that are told about people finally kind of grasping the sovereignty of God. It's not as big a deal as that, I grant you. But when people first kind of latch on to the idea that God really is sovereign in all things, all of a sudden they see it all over. It lights up from the page all over the place. It's huge. It's marvelous. It's wonderful. And let me tell you, missionaries that go out to hard fields, they understand something better about the sovereignty of God than when they first arrived. If they stay, they realize it's not human effort. It's not me doing it. It's what God is doing. But I, I say a similar thing happens when you start seeing the church and you start realizing that pretty much every time those one another commands are mentioned, every time we get a, a slew of put-offs and put-ons, every time we see the term the church, ecclesia, used, we should think local church. Now, there are some instances where it is more universal, granted, but let the context tell you that, not your assumption. You follow? So one of the cardinal rules of, of uh, Bible study is don't let your assumptions give you preconceptions about what this text says before you even start reading and studying it. That's really hard to practice, guys, because we just all have our foibles that way. But... As we do, as we see the local church for what it is, and we see it displayed out in the New Testament, we have this growing awareness that, wow, it's the local church that God is after. It's the local church interaction. It's, it's the obedience to God's word in a grassroots level. It's not simply the delivery of truth on Sunday morning. That's very important, essential, I'm not downplaying that. we got to have that. But it's what do people do with it when they leave the service? That's the dynamic, organic, living local church. It should change a little bit of our understanding. What difference does it make to your people's understanding and vital participation in your church? I think your people need to understand that the church is glorious. It is the way that God has determined from eternity past to make his wisdom known to onlookers so that they see the gospel portrayed in the life of the church, in the humility, in the deference, in the working together, in the solving of stresses and problems of life, and even, even places at times when you have people who are in disagreement in the church, working those things out for the glory of God. It should make a difference in your people's understanding. They need to commit to the local church. They need to be all in. That's what it takes. It's not just attending, checking that box. It's being a part of the body, which does mean a, a bigger commitment. It may mean some sacrifice. Maybe both parents don't have to attend every soccer game. Sorry. Sorry. 
I just stepped on somebody's cleats. <laughs> Maybe some, some allowance should be made for attending other church things and connecting with church people. It doesn't mean that you live exclusively in this bubble because we do have to have non-Christian friends in our neighborhood, workplace, school, wherever, that we're sharing the gospel with. Yeah, I get that. But how many times do we say, oh yeah, you know, I stayed home from this thing so that I could witness to my neighbor. And all we did is watch NFL. That ain't evangelism. Right? So if you're going to stay consistent, all right, be consistent. Do it. Do what you say. But it, it does make a big difference in individual church members' understanding of the importance and significance of the local church. We say this in Propempo, that the local church is the seedbed, which was already used uh, today in a message, but it's, it's the beginning of missions, right? And it is the goal of missions that's the end of missions. So local churches for every people group on earth is what God is after to bring people around the throne. What difference does it make to oversight of your church? Do you value Christ's bride in the way that he intended? Do you look at these precious souls that have been entrusted to you in such a way that you're constantly encouraging them and helping them to see the importance of body life and of personal growth? That they're actually growing? What is, what is the trajectory of their spiritual life? Is it going up generally? Or is it just staying even? Or is it going down? It's a big deal when you're talking about shepherding and oversight. What difference does it make to your discernment and decisions about ministries you support? Now I'm really meddling. <laughs> but I think it makes a difference. If you understand this, you need to understand that... The ministries that you support ought to have a conscious connection to a local church. I've got some illustrations of that. Uh, none of them are very easy, but churches easily find themselves responding with missionary financial support to people who ask, right? And these people mean well, and maybe they're doing something that is very legitimate and good, but I'm telling you, in view of the Bible study we just did, if they're not connecting the fruit of their ministry to the local church, then you need to start asking questions. Should we really be supporting those people? If they're just doing something on campus, or they're doing something overseas, or they're just doing media this, or support that, or technical the other, okay, that's nothing wrong in and of itself. We need those kinds of people serving in missions, but where is the connection to local church planting and development? Where does that happen? And it's okay to challenge them. If you support them, that's part of the life of a missionary. You have the right to ask questions. You do. You're helping to pay the bill. If you're the sending church, you have an even bigger responsibility. If you're the sending church, you need to make sure that people you send are really making that connection so that the local church as an end goal is in their sights all the time, no matter what they're doing. They're looking at this like, how does this methodology, how does this activity, how does this ministry opportunity connect with establishing and strengthening local churches, indigenous local churches? Now that's scary, and I just probably made a bunch of missionaries angry at me, but... I, that's the way I see it. I think biblically we don't have any wiggle room on that. We've got to go there. What difference does it make to your decision, discernment and decisions about strategies and methodologies and end goals of ministry both at home and abroad? We, friends, we don't do ministry stuff just to be doing ministry stuff. Activity in itself is not strategy. We need to be doing the stuff that makes a difference that's in line with God's eternal purpose and seeing the church strengthened 
and God glorified through the local church and all of those ramifications. We don't have time to run into it all in this session, but there you go. It should make a difference to our discernment and decisions in even asking questions about strategies and methodologies and end goals, both on the field and at home where we're doing. So someone makes a proposal to your elders and says, I think I want to start such and such a ministry, or I think our church ought to be involved in this. We have this all the time in our church. And it's lots of fun to say no. <laughs> Doesn't it feel good to say no to stuff that you know you should say no to? I mean, you wrestle with it, and you have all kinds of dyspepsia, and you're upset, and you think, oh, man, I don't know what these people are going to think. And then you say no, and you go, oh, man, that was the right thing to do. And as it works out, it was the right thing to do. <laughs> but learning how to say no so that you have room to say yes to the things that are really most important and most on target, that's the essence of insightful leadership. It's learning where the boundaries are, being able to do that, have the guts to do it. So we have people say, you know, we, we want to have this ministry to um, unwed mothers, but we want other people in the church to do it. We just think it's a good idea. We say, eh, no. If you're not willing to be involved, it's not a great idea, right? You have to be willing to get your hands dirty in this thing. Um, what if they say, oh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm willing to get my hands dirty in this particular instance. This is a real instance, and we're going to try it out. We say, okay, fine. You get other people to stand with you, to pray with you, and hold your hands and be able to, to work through this thing. It's a ministry to unwed mothers. It's home-based, and you're just trying to help these gals kind of get through this tough part in their life. And, and share the gospel. Fine, do that. Didn't last too long. We didn't invest too much in it. it. It just, it wasn't God's time, perhaps. It didn't take off. Maybe it was the wrong sort of curriculum they developed or whatever. Just didn't work. But then we didn't go and sell it to the whole church. We wanted to make sure that it's doing the right thing. So strategies and methodologies, there's, there's a bazillion of them. And you'll find it out on the field. Missionaries come home with some of the wackiest ideas for what their methodology should be. Go back and watch the 1950s film, The Gospel Blimp. You need to be discerning about how you do this. What is really the end goal here? What, is, it, is it contributing to the growth and development of local church? And then we'll get there. So... This is uh, the Blitz overview of the centrality of the local church and missions. I want to just tell you that I have a book project to develop this a little bit more. So if you think about it, pray with me that I would do this. I think that it is a message that needs to be heard. I don't know if there's anything else specifically written on this. Um, the centrality of the local church in missions. And even if you left the in missions part off, it's still important. There's lots of really good stuff in ecclesiology and not very much out there that lends itself, that leans into missions as part of God's big plan and goal. I am early. I want to give you a couple other notes. If you didn't pick up the handout, there's handouts, I think. Are there still some available on the little round table next to the double doors over on that side? You might want to get that. The next two sessions sort of build on this and are very practical on local church stuff, working it out with uh, focus and effectiveness, and also uh, 10 Keys, I think, is the third one. We're going to have it right here so you know the place. It's very good. But I want to know if you have questions or darts. Yes, sir. between one local church and another local church that folks are seeking support from and I mean obviously there's probably a sending church but still there's a cooperative effort there and there are signals of some sort being sent by other churches and I just um, not everybody has maybe the same framework um, when they go right so for the sake of the recording, the question is, uh, what if we're a small church and we don't really have the means to, to send directly? 
Um, I believe there is a lot of cooperation that goes on. The missionary sending church should be the church that he's being sent out from or that he grew up in, so to speak. Um, but you need to find like-minded churches that are near you um, as much as possible and find out, can we cooperate in these things? What it generally means, practically, is that you're not supporting a whole bunch of missionaries for smaller amounts. You're supporting a few missionaries for much bigger amounts. And that works out so much better in about a dozen different ways, and I'll cover that in a subsequent workshop. Uh, but it just works out so much better to have your ownership and fingerprints around that, and you really know those people and love those people and count on those people to extend your church into that ministry wherever they are internationally. So if you, if you haven't already done so, start creating a fellowship or association or pastorium or whatever you want to call it of, uh, of like-minded churches and agree together. If God raises up a missionary from one of our churches, we're going to do our best to try to support that couple, that guy, to go do the thing together as much as possible. When Kathy and I went out to the field, her home church pastor said, I'm going to pray that you get all of your support in 10 churches. Well, in, in our day and time, you know, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, that was unheard of because missionaries often traipsed all around the country and they would have 50 churches supporting them for $25 a month or something. And we said, okay, uh, we're game for that. We'll pray. You know how many churches we had when we left for the field? Ten churches. And those relationships continue to this day. Um, it's just amazing to us. But they... but. That amount of churches, there were other individuals involved as well, but the, the church relationship thing was a really big deal. So encourage and help your missionary to nurture relationships with fewer churches that go deeper. We have a question regarding the fruitfulness of seeing that in turn. What would that look like? What, what would be some things that you would encourage us to look for and uh, just seeing that missionary work, let's say, for an example, out in, um, you know, Honduras or some other uh, Chile, um, what would be something in turn we should uh, see? Okay, the question has to do with fruitfulness and how we can sort of evaluate that as a, as a supporting church or sending church and, and see that work out on the field. Different countries may have different levels of fruitfulness in God's providence, how that works out. Um, I think the, what the basic biblical challenge is to be faithful and are they choosing to do the right things? I really shudder when I read missionary newsletters, of which there are more than a few, that claim they're doing a whole bunch of ministry and basically they're reporting on other people's ministries. Uh, they, they're reporting on ministry that's just a continuation of same old, same old that they've done for 10 or 15 or 20 years. And they're not, they have no new initiatives to actually plant other churches or even to encourage and strengthen uh, national or indigenous church pastors. And just blows my mind that their sending church puts up with it. So the church has a role. That accountability thing, reporting back to the church at Antioch, hey, that's a big deal. You've got to help your missionaries stay on track. You have to help them struggle through the hard times and make it through, but also in the choices that they make about what kinds of ministries and strategies, methodologies they're using, maybe maybe it's literature or media or whatever way they're doing it, that they're, they're doing stuff that fairly represents what you understand to be biblical and represents your, what your local church would do in their place if you were there. So that's a tough question, brother. Um, fruitfulness in and of itself isn't the issue. The issue is faithfulness and the accountability part of that. How do you do it? All right? Maybe one or two other questions. Yes, sir. Okay, um, so I'm going to repeat the question. Um, how much does it cost in a cooperative type of a program? And there's administrative overhead or administrative levy to that. How much then actually gets to the field? So I'm going to try to answer what you're really asking um, and not what you really said. Okay. Uh, mission agencies uh, fulfill a legitimate role. Um, there are some mission agencies that take more administrative levy than others. 
And generally speaking, it's somewhere between 8% to 20% off the top. Um, I maintain that for a local church to send directly is more complex than they think. Just because we have Google doesn't make us omniscient. And it doesn't give us automatic experience on the field and with legal issues and national visa issues and so forth. So there are good, good things that mission agencies may do for your particular missionary. What I advocate for is this. Match up what is the best opportunity for that missionary and that ministry with your church. So that as close as possible, they're like-minded doctrinally, but also that they're going to be effective facilitators of doing anything you want done. That's number one. Number two is do not give your people to anyone without a pre-signed partnership agreement with that organization. I've had, I've had churches not hear me clearly enough on this, so I want to be super clear. Don't send your person to somebody's candidate school and have them sign on the dotted line to become their minion until or unless you have a signed partnership agreement giving a wide door of the church's role and responsibility in the whole thing. And this book, here to there, has a sample partnership agreement in the back of it. You can get it. Um, you can probably get it from our website, propempo.com, for free. Just look it up. A sample partnership agreement. Now, the brother here was not asking about that kind of a cooperative program or a mission agency related to a denomination or a third-party agency, but just churches working together. And I'm just telling you, if you booked the time it takes for your church people to manage that person to send them directly, you'll be paying the same amount. Now, you do want to be careful. There are agencies that will charge you a lot. Um, but that doesn't absolve the church from walking through the whole qualification process. Like, again, don't believe the mission agency that the person is qualified. They're not qualified until the church says they're qualified. We've seen that over and over and over again. People crash and burn on the field. Preventable attrition is atrocious, it's horrible. It's a terrible experience for anybody and everybody involved. You don't want that to happen. Unpreventable attrition, I get that, that happens. But preventable attrition because of unrealistic expectations and lack of accountability to a local church relationship, those things we got, we can do something about that. Yes, sir. Are sent missionaries like parents in the sense that they don't become the pastors of the churches they're in, the local churches, but um, raise up those local churches, then go on to other local churches? And I ask this question because um, I heard a, a missionary. Well, he, the church can't fire me because I'm supported by another church. And so I, I'm here to help them, but there's, there's this gap between the local church's authority and his authority, which is, uh, you know, the mission board. So is there like a – where is there a line that, that, that you kind of have to find with your missionaries when you send them out, or uh, do you send them out to, be, to become local – Okay, um, the question for the recording's sake is that um, there, there's often a confusion of roles and authority when a um, missionary maybe goes to a church or raises us a church or maybe goes to an existing church and then the role of the sending church back home versus the local church that they're working with can be confused and can cause all kinds of issues. Um, and I say, warning, warning, Mr. Robertson, warning. If, if that occurs, then, then somebody hasn't worked it out ahead of time. It's better to work it out ahead of time. Um, also, there's this instance of uh, missionaries going to the field and uh, on, the one, on the one case, raising up a church, and they're supported from outside, obviously, from the home country, whatever, and the local church there maybe doesn't like them or maybe wants things to go a different way. And they don't seem to have the ability to make those changes because the guy is claiming sort of uh, diplomatic exemption from that. 
right? Because they come from somewhere else. And you already know the New Testament word for that. So, um, yeah. Uh, th there's the other case in which a missionary enters into a relationship with an established local church overseas. And again, the prior agreement and working out of details is so important to solve problems before they happen. And just work it through and do the best you can. Having the church leaders on the one side and the church leaders on the home side or the sending church side in first name relationship with each other and communicating can circumvent the problems that that difficult missionary may pose. And frankly, the sending church has the right to say, um, you need to come home and let's talk about it until we get it figured out. Right? And we've seen this happen before, fairly recently actually, in an unreached people, big part of the world, and this missionary said, I'm staying, and the local, and the local church said, we don't really want you anymore. We got this now, and, and the home church is like, uh, we don't know who to believe, what to do. And unfortunately, I think the sending church did the wrong thing. They just kind of let them hang out and do whatever. No. Got to, I mean, it's not like you have to get on a ship for six months, right, to, to float back to England or something. It's not like that. It's like, okay, invest some money, get them back home, sit down and really talk about it, have a first-name conversation with the people over there, Get those things worked out. And if he doesn't belong in that space, again, move him. And maybe he doesn't belong in that space ever again. But you just have to, you have to get the real data and not simply take the missionary's word for it. This happens oh, too, way too often. The, the church takes the side of the missionary no matter what. And the guy's a stinker and they just don't know it. And they believe them. And then they, then they kind of meddle in and say, oh, we're the sending church. We have authority to do this and that. And it's like, you're working on no data, guys. Come on. Do your due diligence. Do the hard work. Send somebody over there. Do whatever it takes to find out what the real story is. And then start working from there prayerfully. All right, you're getting me all excited. I, did, I deal with this all the time. We've had so many churches call me and say, we got a problem, missionary. Okay, tell me about it. All right, let's work it out. And like a month later, they go, oh, man, that was too easy. You solved it. Like, well, yeah, you know, I've dealt with missionaries. I are one. So it's like, yeah, you just, they're not superhuman people, and, and they're not particularly holy. They may be somewhat more godly because of the environment and the cauldron they've been in, hammered, by God to, to grow in godliness, but they're still not infallible, friends. Okay. Um, what if you find a, a missionary that all the marks check out? You know, they're, they're strong, they're teaching, they're training, they're evangelizing, they're doing everything we believe in. Um, but the impact on the local church, you, saw, you said they, they should be strengthening us as well. Uh, it's not really seen. Uh, we can't really send that many people to connect up, but we know what they're saying and what they're doing and what is effective. Our aim is, our blessing is that we can be that rope of strength and helping that missionary to do the work. But should that be enough? Or when you mean they should be strengthening the local church, what, what should we be expecting? Yeah. Um, so the question has to do with what about the local church on the receiving end? And, and you have a, a missionary who seems to be doing all the right kinds of things and they're checking all the boxes. Um, and yet, it's actually not helping that much. Um, in most cases, my, you know, right from the hip kind of thing is probably that missionary needs to go somewhere else. Um, probably the indigenous church needs to stand on its own and be strong and still defer to counsel maybe from a distance, but not have this guy every week, every week be there doing his thing because it, it causes a big shadow and an eclipse, if you will, over the locals doing their job. So, oh man, we're, we are really out of time. There's, there's a great illustration that's coming up in one of the next workshops about indigeneity, and I'd love to share it with you. But let me just close in prayer very, very quickly. Lord, please take these considerations and use them for your glory in your church. In Jesus' name, amen.